So I'm going to, Peter talks kind of about an overview of all the work we've been doing, and I'm going to talk about one particular bit of it um, that we've touched on already around Cambridge Analytica and some of the history and how to understand it. Um, and for me, this starts um, when we were investigating uh, that donation from Vote Leave to Darren Grimes that Peter talked about. And Vote Leave also gave a group to another organisation, a smaller organisation, called Veterans for Britain. And so I thought I'd look and see, you know, who are Veterans for Britain. And um, this, for me, opened up a whole world that uh, I spend a lot of time worrying about now. And uh, so Veterans for Britain was one of the many kind of groups in the Leave universe. And on its advisory board was, was this chap, um, a guy called Field Marshal Lord Guthrie, the former head of the British Army, so the, the most senior uh, figure in the British Army. He was known as Tony's general at one point because he was sort of hand-in-hand hand with Tony Blair during the Iraq War and very much in favour of that. And, um, and I started looking into what he's up to these days. And the first thing that kind of terrified me is that a couple of years before the referendum, Lord Guthrie, um, having retired from the army, started working for a company called Acarnum. Has anyone heard of Acarnum? No. So uh, this is Acarnum. Um, Acarnum is a private intelligence <coughs> agency. It uh, employs the former head of the US intelligence service. It employs the former head of the French int intelligence service. It employed the guy who um, ran the Israeli intelligence service and basically transformed it into the... Uh, notorious machine it is today until he died and it employed the former head of employees the former head of the British Army and they um, do intelligence work for sovereign governments and global multinational corporations how much else they do we have no idea but the fact that they're able to attract the most senior figures in the intelligence world implies that they are pretty good at what they do um, their vice chair is a guy who uh, used to be the head of the NCA in the UK, the National Crime Agency in the, in the UK, and as a result of that was um, the chair of a thing called the Five Eyes Group. Do you know what Five Eyes is? So, so Five Eyes is the uh, collaboration between GCHQ in the UK, the NSA, and the kind of surveillance groups for Australia and New Zealand and whatever. But the, you know, it's, it's um, famous because of the Edward Snowden revelations and you know, the extent to which they spy on our lives. So the guy who used to run that now works also for this private mercenary intelligence agency uh, selling intelligence around the world to sovereign governments, including the government of Kazakhstan, and to um, private companies. As you can see here, it says on their homepage, uh, at the highest level of decision-making, trusted counsel and accurate intelligence make the crucial difference between success and failure in the global marketplace. Um, lord Guthrie is a lord, so that means he's a member of the House of Lords and therefore has to declare his interests. And uh, if you look on his register of interests here, you see a firm, as well as a condom, a firm called Palantir. Do you know what Palantir is? So, um, first thing about Palantir is it's a private company, so you can't just ring up a stockbroker and ask them to buy shares in it. If you've got shares in Palantir, that's because you've come to an arrangement with Palantir. Um, Palantir is a company founded by Peter Thiel, who's also co-founder of PayPal, and I think was on the board of, is it Facebook, for a while. Um, uh, before he founded it, Peter Thiel wrote this essay in 2009, in which he said that because we gave women the vote, capitalism and democracy are, um, capitalist democracy is an oxymoron, he said, and therefore we need to destroy democracy in order to save capitalism, and someone needs to invent the technology in order to do that. And shortly after this, he said, have a... Uh, he set up um, Palantir with support from the CIA. Um, Palantir is a data analysis company, which, we, again, we don't really know what it does, but we do know that it's worked with GCHQ in the UK, it's worked with the CIA, it's worked with the Isra Israeli intelligence, it's worked with Australian intelligence. So, um, again, a somewhat worrying company. Palantir, by the way, um, the names are interesting. So Palantir is the all-seeing stone in the Lord of the Rings, and Akarnum means secret in Latin. So, uh, to give you a sense of <laughs> how these people like to see themselves. <laughs> um, now, as Peter says, you know, we shouldn't... It's important not to get overexcited about these groups. You know, this is, you know, they like to big themselves up. They like to give themselves sort of shady names. They want us to be afraid of them. 
they're probably doing the same, same sort of thing as organisations like this have always done, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. But that also doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about the fact that you've got you know, security services of the world with the most sophisticated surveillance operations, the surveillance operations which would make the Stasi in East Germany look like a joke, um, running these data analysis firms trying to influence politics around the world. And that, that's what they're doing. Um, so how do we uh, understand all of this? Well, so, so after, we'd, after I'd been doing that work, uh, a couple of months later, the whole Cambridge Analytica story broke. And so I've been thinking a lot about you know, this relationship between uh, military security and privatization of intelligence and the way these processes work and data companies. So I thought I'd look into who Cambridge Analytica are. And Cambridge Analytica really is just a kind of, um, it's a subsidiary of another company called SCL. People heard of SCL? Strategic Communication Laboratories. And so who are SCL? Well, you can go to their homepage and it tells you they're not that secret about these things. The SCL Group provides data analysis and strategy to governments and military organizations worldwide. For over 25 years, we've conducted behavioral change programs. It's a very nice little phrase, behavioral change programs. <laughs> uh, in over 60 countries and have been formally recognized for our work in defense and social change. Uh, SCL is a defense contractor. It's a, um, it's a military company. It's a mercenary propaganda firm. And, um, and so it's very hard, again, to know what they've done, but research I've done and others have done has shown that they definitely were working. They did opinion polls in Afghanistan, for example, and that um, you know, they've been working in major military conflicts, particularly since the Afghan and Iraq wars, with significant contracts from uh, Western governments to do this. And this is where they developed their skills, is how they learned how to do this stuff. And so the question then is, you know, how to understand this? How do, we, how do we kind of come up with a way to get our heads around what's going on? And for me, um, to do so, we have to go back a bit. I'm just going to look at um, a thing. We have to go back um, to uh, and understand what, what the two things. And the first is thinking about the history of military propaganda. And so... Um, you know, for me, I always think about this famous essay, when I think about this, by the French uh, theorist, Baudrillard, who famously claimed that the Gulf War did not take place. And what he meant by that was not that, you know, it wasn't a war in the early 90s in the Gulf, but that the relationship between our experience on watching on telly, what happened, and the reality of what happened on the ground was so great that you can't call them the same thing. So if the Gulf War is the thing that people saw on telly, then it's going to have a different name from the reality on the ground, which is just a decimation of Iraq. And that ties into a long history. Um, and I think it's important to think that through to understand how communication technology has changed. So people seen the film Citizen Kane? So Citizen Kane is about the invention of essentially tabloid journalism in the States, where they, um, they invented new, new kind of what we would call tabloid journalism in order to cover the American Spanish War. And they basically, you know, fictionalized a large chunk of what happened there in order to tell Americans the story they wanted to hear about this war. Um, and that was how war was generally covered, you know, long, for a long time until the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, um, which was seen as a huge military and strategic defeat for America. And the point at which the Vietnam War was essentially lost, they, the American military believed, was when they lost the propaganda war at home around the Tet Offensive. So the, um, the Viet, you know, because the way that American journalists had been free to cover what had happened, the defeat of American forces on that day, there was a huge drop in morale at home and then loss of support for the war. And as a result, ultimately, America lost the Vietnam War. And so Americans thought, well, we can't let that happen again. And then the British came along with the Falklands War and they invented a new technique in propaganda and journalism called embedded journalism. So they took tabloid journalists along on their boats and they let these sort of you know, guys with like semi-military uniforms come out of boats with them and write about how you know, they were the first people in the Falklands and wasn't it bloody brilliant and our boys are total heroes and, and Thatcher as a result had a massive propaganda victory in the Falklands War because the army had managed to control the information that people at home got about the war. And then a few years later we get to the Gulf War and the Gulf War coincided with the invention 
of rolling news and the first 24-hour news channel, CNN. And so the Pentagon took CNN and they said, well, yeah, you can have access to the war field if we can place where the cameras are. <laughs> and so basically what you got was a film directed from the Pentagon, broadcast home in America 24 hours a day, so American audiences saw the film, saw the version of the war that the Pentagon wanted them to see, because the only way that CNN could get access to the war was to accept that, and they got incredible footage. I could show you a film later on of some of the footage that people saw of, you know, planes, of like cameras on planes showing exciting shots, and of course that's great footage for CNN, but it's not an accurate account of what happened to the people who have been bombed on the ground. It's propaganda. And of course, what's happened in the last 20 years is that military propaganda has had to learn to keep up with the changing technology of the day, and so we've had the arrival of social media. And so in the 90s, as the internet began to emerge, this guy called Nigel Oakes, an old Etonian like his friend Alexander Nick, set up a company called Strategic Communication Laboratories, which sold militaries around the world online propaganda. Um, it wasn't just SCL. In fact, the biggest contract we know about to do this is, um, people heard of a firm called Bell Pottinger? So Bell Pottinger got a half billion dollar contract from the Pentagon to do propaganda around the Iraq war, and they did things like making fake videos to convince Iraqis to do what they wanted, and you know, the whole load of basically lies they spread on the internet in Iraq in order to win the propaganda war, or try and win the propaganda war in Iraq. Half a billion pounds, that's, you know, <laughs> we talk about the influence of a bit of money in, in the UK referendum, but that's, that's a huge amount of money. And, um, and within that ecosystem, Strategic Communications Laboratories seems to have played a particular function, which is what's called psychological operations. So that's sort of um, you know, doing, attempting to do more sophisticated analysis of the data that you have in order to better understand your audience, in order to manipulate them and get what you want. And of course, once you have a private company, SCL, uh, they realise, well, we don't just have to do work in war zones, we can go and do work wherever we like, and where's the big money in politics? <coughs> Well, it's in American elections. And so they went off and they ended up running Donald Trump's campaign for president because these guys were the best experts in how to use data to produce propaganda in the technology of the age. And Aggregate IQ, although there's some legal wrangling about their exact relationship with SCL and Cambridge Analytica is essentially you know, part of the same network. It's the same people who've similarly learnt from war zones, how to do military propaganda, and brought those lessons back home to run campaigns in the UK and possibly elsewhere in the world. And for me, there's another important way to understand it. So if, if one way is thinking about how military propaganda and technology have shifted over the last century, and this is where we're at now, the other way is thinking about the modern history of capitalism. Because you know, the thing that defines the current era is neoliberalism. And for me, neoliberalism is, is two things. Partly it's an ideology, so partly it's the belief that we should uh, privatise as much as possible. Sure, we privatise as much as possible and that you know, the market should decide things. But it's also an historic phase of capitalism after imperialism. So you know, Western capital conquered the world, it killed all the black people and stole their stuff and made itself richer. And then once it had conquered the world geographically, the next thing it did was turn back and eat up the states of Western countries. And so we see the privatisation of the NHS, you see the privatisation of education systems. And we've now got to the point that the core functions of the state, the monopoly on violence, and um, in fact also the civil service, crucially, are being more privatised than ever. And so it's not just propaganda that's been privatised. So um, I've got the figures here, but in 2003, at the start of the Iraq war, the, um, the total foreign office... Uh, bill for outsourcing um, security work was just £12 million. By 2015, that, that figure grew rapidly throughout the, after the Iraq war. And uh, by 2015, even one contract for G4S, the security firm, um, added up to £100 million. The G4S got the contract for guarding the UK embassy in Afghanistan for £100 million. And in the autumn of last year, the Taliban raided a military base in Afghanistan which was run by G4S rather than by the British Army, and you know, people were killed. So G4S now are essentially you know, replacing the British Army, fighting Britain's wars. And of course, what that means is there's no accountability, because Theresa May, 
um, you know, as Prime Minister, is accountable for where, and we know where British soldiers are sent, we know when we've declared war on a country, we really have no idea where the private security companies, the private you know, the mercenary firms that um, the UK government now uses are fighting. There's evidence that they did go into Syria, even though Parliament voted for the army not to go into Syria because they're not the army, so that's not you know, breaking the, the parliamentary instruction, for example. And so, um, you know, for me to understand the Cambridge Analytica story, you need to understand that in the last 20 years, we've seen the mass privatisation of the military alongside other key functions of the state in the UK. The UK is the world centre for mercenary companies. It's, there's two industries that the UK leads the world in, money laundering and mercenaries. And, um, and those are the two industries primarily which back Brexit, by the way. Um, and you know, to understand Cambridge Analytica, you have to understand it's just the, sci it's the psychological operations wing of our new privatised military. And in that context, I think it's really quite concerning. And you know, just to, to wrap up and, and also give my answer to the question we had before, people often think that these things are magic and that they, you know, that they do some kind of voodoo trick and they just con you into believing a thing, or they think that it's all ridiculous and we shouldn't be afraid of them. And the way I see it is it's just the same as old-fashioned propaganda. You know, we're used to tabloid newspapers spreading narratives and telling us lies. That's a very common thing that's happened in the UK for years. Oligarchs own our newspapers. They spread lies on our streets. That's how the Tories have controlled the country for most of the last hundred years. And you know, we're used to, um, to you know, the technology changing and very powerful people learning to use that technology in order to try and influence our politics. And we're also used to not believing it. And people are often quite wise to that. And there's a always a contest in politics between you know, powerful people using the technology of the day to communicate their messages and try and spread the, the narratives they want in politics and other people organising democratically and trying to fight back against that. And that's not a new phenomenon, but what's changed is the technology and what's changed is the ability to reach different audiences and to understand how to appeal to them and to win them over. And that's just the next step in the changing te technology communications and propaganda of the age, and it sits alongside the emerging think tanks of producing ideas, it sits alongside you know, broader PR work, and it sits alongside, frankly, you know, the primary means of distribution of ideas, which is still tabloid newspapers and television. And you, know, you can only understand these things together. Um, and so that's me. Thanks. <laughs>